Namibia, a country of great beauty, bordering South Africa to the northwest, rich in land and natural resources. Twice the size of Germany, Namibia's population is just 2.5 million people. But most Namibians live in extreme poverty. The former German colony has one of the biggest income gaps in the world. A white minority, descendants of the colonizers of German Southwest Africa, still own the lion's share of Namibia's assets. The scars left by the brutality of Germany's colonial regime are deep. Between 1904 and 1908, Germany carried out the first genocide of the 20th century here. More than 80,000 Herero and Nama were systematically killed by German soldiers. Namibia only gained independence from South Africa in 1990. Today, few Namibians see any of the wealth generated by their country's natural resources. Protests against the country's colonial legacy are frequent. The German must pay us. They have to pay the price. Power to the workers. As are demonstrations against foreign investors. We don't even know if Namibia belongs to Namibia, it belongs to China. And secret deals with North Korea have come to light. $29 million transferred from Namibia to Pyongyang. Big game is under threat. In 2022, the number of rhinos poached in Namibia nearly doubled. A rhino is worth more dead than alive. The city of Swakopmund is located at the edge of the desert on the Atlantic coast. It doesn't look like a typical African city, with its neo-baroque buildings, German street names, and spiked helmets. It's like a little Germany in Africa. They are all from the old German style, so um, from the old buildings in town, they try and keep the style similar so that it creates a nice, equal vibe in town. Sylvia Kleinstuber is of German origin. Her family has lived in Namibia for generations. Germany colonized the country from 1884 to 1915. Sylvia runs the city's best-known cafe. It's famous for its German baked goods. And then our uh, apple strudel is one of our best sellers. A sliver of layer cake, please. Okay, a small one. Nearly everyone speaks German here. It's a lingua franca. Yeah. You speak German? A little. <laughs> How did you learn? I learned it through the customers. Every day you have to learn something new, new word. Sylvia's younger sister, Desiree, works in the kitchen. She's making a black forest cake. She's using her grandfather's recipe. He was a baker who immigrated to Swakopmund in 1954. He came from Germany here after the war. He didn't want to stay anymore. And they had family here already, just for trying it out. Okay. And there's a black forest. So I'm going to give that to the front. Today, around 30,000 descendants of German settlers live in Namibia. The sister's mother, Heide, was the first person in the family to be born here. She wouldn't trade her life in Namibia for anything in the world. I think we are very fortunate to live in Namibia. We've got lots of quality, life quality, to be free. You, you, you won't feel to live in uh, No, 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 uh, no, never, yeah. Never? <laughs> no. You look like... That After much. a few weeks in Germany, um, it gets too green for me. I look for my browns, uh -huh. desert browns, yeah. She's passed on her love of the desert to her daughter, Sylvia. Every day, Sylvia goes out for a long ride across the enormous dunes of Svakobmund. Not far from the site of early 20th century atrocities.
hundreds of improvised graves are located just a few metres from the dunes. Imperial Germany set up concentration camps here as it waged wars of colonisation. Between 1904 and 1908, the German army massacred between 65,000 and 80,000 Herero and at least 10,000 to 20,000 Nama, both ethnic minorities in Namibia. Germany was responsible for the first genocide of the 20th century. Every year, a unique parade is held in Swakopmund. The Herero march to mark the liberation of the concentration camp there. They wear uniforms styled after the Imperial German armies. When we killed the German soldiers, we took over their, their, their attire, we took over their, their uniform, and we said, these are ours now from now on. An engineering professor, Kavita Marama, travelled 500 kilometres just to take part in the parade. His grandmother was held in the concentration camp. She was only nine years old then. Herero civilians, men, women and children, were enslaved and starved. General Lothar von Trotter's murderous orders were as follows. Within German territory, every Herero, armed or unarmed, with or without livestock, is to be shot. I will no longer take in women or children, drive them back to their people, or let the troops shoot them. More than a century later, in May 2021, Germany's foreign minister made an historic announcement. We describe these events today, officially, as what they were, a genocide. With that, we also recognize our historical responsibility. Germany went on to pledge 1.1 billion euros in aid. The communities affected by the genocide were to play a key role in implementation. These demonstrators also want the land confiscated by German colonizers returned to them. Germans should stop for our people, for us to withdraw. They must give our land back. They must pay. They must pay. They, must pay. Well, yeah. they have to pay the price. <laughs> On the morning of the parade, Kavita is accompanied by Jarij Teja, an activist ready to fight for his country. <laughs> we are warriors, we are soldiers in fact. So whatever you do, what, how, whatever dealings you want to do with us, you must know that you are dealing with a, a, a tribe that is so proud of itself. They drive to a farm owned by descendants of German settlers. When you look at uh, both sides of the road, né, from where we started, this is still a single unit. That's covering over 60,000 hectares. So 60,000 hectares, you are talking about the size of Berlin, owned, owned by one person. They're going to a place of prayer, the site of the first battle between the Germans and the Herero. and their ancestors who died that day are buried here. We believe our people don't die. They are somewhere, they are alive, they can hear, they can talk, they can solve our problems. Ancestors, I'm here with Kavita. Please let him come to you. We want to follow in your footsteps and we ask for power and strength to open doors and be courageous. This is sacred land for them. But to visit the graves, they need the landowner's permission. Where is the bus? Are you filming me? Could you please stop the camera on our yeah. private ground? We want to go to the graves. Uh, what graves? Uh, our ancestors' graves. Why, why, why are you graves? saying what graves? There's not a single ancestor grave. We've this only got German graves here. We know, we know where it is. We oh, know where yeah. we are going. Mm. It's just that it's in your farm. You must make an appointment before the time. Is it? Then we take you with our car. Mm -hmm. Cost 500 rand per person. Mm -hmm. We can make you a special price. Mm -hmm. And uh, when does it suit you? We wanted to go now. 
No, mm. it's not possible now. This is lunchtime now. Adjusting yeah. the contacts. Okay. <laughs> In 2022, an article in the country's most popular newspaper, The Namibian, created a scandal. Harry Schneider Waterberg, a major landowner and descendant of the settlers, took part in a panel discussion. His comments were printed. Later, he maintained that his statement was taken out of context. German settlers never stole any land. He is treating us the very same way his ancestors treated our ancestors. We are going to act, and we are going to rebel. Do you think you could forgive them? Not no. now. Morning, when you see a white person, that trauma is coming back. The man whose comments were so incendiary owns an enormous 400 square kilometer farm on the Waterberg Plateau. Harry Schneider Waterberg lives here with his wife, Sonia. At some point, I'll be working with cattle somewhere. But now, I've got to go back into the office again, unfortunately. Later. How come do you have the same name of the plateau? <laughs> that was the idea of my grandfather's, to add the, the name of the, of, the, of the mountain to his surname. It had to be approved by parliament, so imagine that. I mean, you know, this young soldier was his grandfather. He came to the country in 1908 to serve in the army. Over time, he bought a total of 18 Herero farms from the German colonial administration and began to raise cattle. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yeah. That over there needs to be cleaned up. Harry has a team of some 40 people working for him. Most are Herero. Every morning he checks in with his assistant to get updates on what happened overnight. We lost a calf. What was its number? 22? 33. The 1,400 head herd of cattle roams the entire property. Harry is one of the biggest beef producers in the country. Every day, he spends hours in the car looking after his livestock. It's a huge piece of land. It is massive. To manage it in such a way that, it, uh, that it's effective uh, is a lot of work, absolutely. A few years ago, he started breeding Arab racehorses. Look there, the horses will come, are coming in. He has to protect more than 100 animals from big cats. Our whole management on, on this farm uh, is adapted to the fact that we have leopards here. We have a lot of leopards here. Leopard is an everyday reality for us. He's already lost three horses in two months. I'm very connected to their land, you know, emotionally. And this farm has given me a, a, a wonderful life. Oscar. White Namibians account for just 6% of the country's population, but most of the farmland belongs to them. Germans are accused to have stolen the land. That is not only in Namibia, so that was in, in, in all colonies as such. That's the story of, of Australia and the Americas. And, and after, the, after in our Namibia independent in 1990, the government of the day asked landowner to have a more fair distribution of, of land. And uh, my, my, my father at the time actually sold uh, some 27% of his land. So, Owning, owning land is not really, uh, doesn't, make you, doesn't make you rich. 
it, uh, it, it's uh, working the land successfully that can make you some money. Harry Schneider's semi-arid land has another important resource on it, water, and plenty of it. The conditions are ideal for raising livestock. One of his Herrero employees, Mandaka, looks after the cattle. He's an absolute uh, hermit. He lives out here completely on his own. Look at his pants. <laughs> He's eccentric. <laughs> He's with me now for 34 years. There's the calf. We wondered where it would be. He ran away, but he came back. Harry is proud of his heritage. He doesn't spend much time thinking about Germany's colonial past or the deeds of his ancestors. It's a very important part of the development of, 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 the, of, the, of the country Namibia, which was at that stage called Southwest Africa. And I mean, you know, and before that it was, it didn't even have a name. I mean, you know, from, or, or European name. I mean, you know, so it was sort of this dark, uh, bit dark Africa at the time. And then some first uh, the, the explorers came in and the development of the country. And I think we've got to appreciate it. Like every, every nation needs to appreciate the history. German settlers were the first to mine Namibian soil for diamonds. When Germany lost World War I, Namibia became a South African protectorate, while the mines went to the multinational company De Beers. The corporation has dominated the diamond market for more than a century. Today, in Namibia alone, it earns millions of euros in profit annually. The diamonds mined here are particularly valuable because they come from a unique source on the Atlantic floor. This mining vessel brings up diamonds from a depth of 150 metres. It belongs to the Namibian government and to bears. of thousands of diamonds are then delivered to the capital, Windhoek. We've been given a special permit to visit this closely guarded place in the centre of the city. Diamonds with a value of hundreds of millions of euros are being sorted in this room. Hey, good afternoon, guys. So, Perez, what do we have here? Paulus Chituna is a supervisor at the semi-nationalised diamond joint venture NDTC. And these were what, first quality, second, yeah. third, fourth? Are we checking the quality? Chituna is the person who determines the value of the gems before they go to market. The whiter and clearer they are, the more they're worth. A stone like that might, might in rough, it might be, let's say, 20,000 US dollars. Okay. But when it's polished, you probably have to add another 30 to 40 pieces. You might have to pay 40,000 for, for a stone like that, yeah. Here are 1,000 diamonds of the highest quality. Their market value is around 29 million euros. You can count them, but it will take you forever. <laughs> so we weigh them at the end of the day. So we don't leave this building until we have uh, what we call, we have, we, have balance, we have reconciled. Each year, 400 kilograms of diamonds end up on this table. The really unique ones are stored separately. Wow. This is the biggest one that we have on this. This is a brilliant, nice colour. This stone, as you can see, looks pink. It's a very rare colour. So we're talking a lot of money on this stone. I mean, Dave was a rough estimate on this. 
This one, it's three, uh, around about three million US dollars for this stone. This is painful. <laughs> when I look at this crack, it's very painful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Why? It hurts. Because yeah. you could have made more money. Yeah. Me and you cannot afford this. <laughs> it's only the shakes are the guys with oil and a lot of money that um, that can buy a stone like that. Because when it gets, goes on auction, even if you go into the prices, they go for serious money. Once they've been polished, these diamonds will be delivered to the world's most renowned jewelers. Yet very few Namibians profit from this wealth. The vast and ancient Namib desert stretches along the country's western coast. The hostile environment beckons prospectors. Hello. Hi, how are you? Very good. Let's dig here. Okay. Every man in Mbando's family is a miner. Should we take the crowbar? Not necessary. He and Osis have long worked as a team. It's like my brother because we are growing up together here at the farm. For 20 years, the two have met twice a month here. Let's look over there. Okay. They're looking for valuable materials. This black tourmaline is that one. Okay. Yeah. Their finds are used for small pieces of jewelry or therapeutic purposes. It's Amazonite. Can you find any diamonds? No, no diamonds around. <laughs> no diamonds around. If there was diamonds, maybe those years oh, we was already rich. <laughs> They're hoping to find stones that can provide them with a better life. They work for hours here. He's making a small hole. Yeah, that one is uh, how we follow the reef. Ne? Then you can then you can get pocket of something like that. Nice pieces. Smoky crystal, Roy. I am looking for big pieces, nice, nice big pieces. What I can sell, maybe big like my hand. They'll only leave the desert after they've found something. A week later, in this small cafe, all eyes are on Mbandu. He proudly shows off his small Amazonite treasures before he sells them. Can I touch? Uh, not that, but look, only look. Yeah. Uh, I think it's wet, but it's dry. What do you think? Is it nice? Or... It's nice, but we don't know. <laughs> He'd like to get $250 for the stones, just enough to cover his living expenses until he can make it back to the desert. He heads to Mike's souvenir shop. Hello. How's it going? Yeah, I have some pieces of stone. Okay, let's have a look, see what you got. Okay. Who cleaned them? And me, self. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lovely colour. Yeah, it's a nice colour. This is not so cool yeah. for us at the moment. Okay. What with all the COVID and no tourists, not too interesting That's at the moment. Mbandu is one of Namibia's last independent prospectors. In the land of diamonds, he leads a life of poverty, a situation many find enraging. On the outskirts of Windhoek lies Katatura. In English, the name means the place where no one would like to live. Most of the residents here live on less than one euro a day. This 31-year-old is a local celebrity. 
How are you? Fine, how are you, mommy? Nah, eh. Can I take a picture? Not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Amushalelo is the charismatic leader of a small radical opposition party. He grew up here. Hi, how's How it going? Man? He wants people here to demand more. They're building luxury apartments in the city, but here, there's nothing. They don't do anything for us. We don't even have paved streets. Right. Take a look for yourself. Does this look like it's a rich country to you? The money in this country is only in the concentration of a few hands, but majority of our people still continue to languish in poverty. It's the hands of who? It's in the hands of the white people and a few elite blacks. In Michael's opinion, SWAPO, the party that's been in power for three decades, is hopelessly corrupt. We're looking for fighters, man. Why don't you join the movement? Namibia's Che Guevara travels in luxury. He says he made his fortune trading cryptocurrencies. He wants to see foreign powers exploiting Namibian workers driven out of the country. Uh, the construction industry has been entirely taken over by the Chinese. So the Chinese have taken over a majority of the contracts in this country. One is this new highway that goes to the airport. If the rain comes, then it washes this road away like there was nothing. Another major problem is that the Chinese companies have allegedly deceived Namibian workers about their wages. The workers called on Michael for help. Power to the workers. They've been striking since then. You people have the power. You must learn to stand up and fight for yourself. Each month, the company deducts 10% of workers' wages for social security contributions. But no contributions have been received by the government since 2019. Now, it is clear that the Swapo government and the Chinese are busy stealing from all of us. Government is always going after small businesses, Namibian-owned companies, forcing them to pay tax. But their Chinese friends, they are busy protecting them. They must refund you all that money, and then you receive tax exemptions. So tell Mr. Wu, Mr. Yi, Mr. Ha Yi, that they are going to pack up their bags because we don't want thieves in this country. Michael has no official authority, but seeks a dialogue anyway. You're in charge? The English is a little poor. It's, it's, it's OK. My, my Chinese is also a little bit poor. They finally agree to negotiate with Michael. No, the media, it has to be transparent. What we have to talk, it has to be on the record. Why are you deducting tax from the workers? but you're not paying it over to the government. I get your point. We agreed that we're going to refund, but we're going to refund, but it will be deducted when the tax... No, you as the company are going to pay that tax that is due to government. But the money of the workers, you are going to give it back to the workers. That money is for their holiday. That is what's going to happen. No. That's it. By Wednesday, the workers are going to report to me. If they have not been paid, then I'll make sure all of you will sit in jail on Thursday. And it's going to be for a very long time. OK, Wednesday, make sure the people are paid. For far too long, Namibia has been known to be a peaceful country. Sometimes you need to use violence in order for you to send a message. And the message is to say that stop exploiting Namibians. If you continue exploiting Namibians, then we'll fight fire with fire. Demanding justice, if needs be, through threatening violence is risky. It could backfire, but for now, it's working. The company pays. The next day, he targets Chinese vendors in Chinatown. So this thing's fake. We take, understand? 
This is not real Havianas. Fake Havianas. Yeah. Tell the Chinese all the shops are closing. After this, Michael is arrested for incitement of violence. China has long been an ally of SWAPO. Since Namibian independence, China has financially supported the ruling party. Most of the public buildings in Windhoek have been built by Chinese contractors. SWAPO headquarters and the Interior Ministry are examples. In the meantime, China controls one of the country's most strategic assets, its uranium mines. Namibia is one of the world's leading producers of uranium. One man has long taken a critical view of China's activities in his country. His location is being kept secret because he receives many threats. I'm definitely under surveillance, without any doubt. And I've been beaten up, um, you know, put into hospital, you know, previous occasion. Um, I have to take some basic precautions at all times. I do not advertise uh, when I'm going away or where I'm going to. John Grobler is Namibia's most famous investigative journalist. He discovered that a third country was actually using China as a cover when it came to contracts for public buildings. Oh, I found this file. Because in here, you have you know, the original documentation, all the invoices you know, on you know, the construction of State House. That's the Namibian presidential headquarters. I and mean, here you can see $29 million transferred from Namibia to Pyongyang. The United Nations does not permit certain deals to be made with North Korea. The penalty for violations is sanctions. When news of the payment became public, all the North Korean construction company's employees left the country within 24 hours. John was first on the scene back then. There was some sort of a panic, you know, and they ran. I mean, they literally left their food standing on the table like that. The UN feared that Namibia was indirectly financing the North Korean nuclear weapons program with projects such as the State House. North Korea also profited from other public contracts, such as the construction of the Museum of Independence. In front of the museum, there's a statue of the country's national hero and former president, Sam Nuyoma. This looks like it's, you know, cast out of bronze, but it is, in fact, uh, it's kind of a plastic. It's like a polymer, and they just spray paint. You can see the cracks appearing everywhere. Uh, this is all fake stick-on stuff. It's like real, uh, it's a facade. A fake museum with half-finished communist-inspired frescoes. What is that supposed to be? Yeah? Because there's a lot of contextualization around it that is missing. Another reason Namibia is so attractive for Asia is its pristine natural environment. Gigantic open spaces and nearly uninhabited. Namibia has only three residents per square kilometre, making it one of the world's most sparsely populated countries. It's a paradise for many wild animals. But hell for an endangered species of rhinoceros. Namibia's largest rhino reserve is located in the northern part of the country. Three wild rhinoceroses are killed daily around the world. Their horns are sold at high prices in Asia. To help protect them from poachers, the reserve brought in a French NGO. Move! And protect, yes. 
We are not Jean-Claude Van Damme or Bruce Lee. I don't want to see that, for example. No. That's for the movie. We are shot. Hey, what are you doing yet? Come yet? You are going to war alone. Come quick, quick, quick. Medical assistance requested. The Rangers are trying to prepare for a real attack. These simulations allow the trainers to assess the reaction of the Rangers in crisis situations. He's bleeding or not? It looks like a military exercise, preparation for an armed battle, a fight for life, and that's just what it is. Worldwide, an average of 150 Rangers are killed each year. How many are you? Seven. Seven. So how many people must go in the bush to save the, your friend? Seven. Seven. And uh, if, how many people did you go? Six. Six. Ah, why? That's my fault. I was, I thought we were going to. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yes, oh, your sir. team was ready. You were not ready. And that's a big, big, big mistake. Do you think Porto's going to say to you, hey, guys, we're going to shoot in three, four minutes. Get ready. No, they will shoot by night, guys. They will shoot by night and you will all be in chaos like this. That's why we train. This is the war of our generation, our century. It's about the survival of hundreds of species, which will die out if we don't act. I've heard of a reserve in South Africa in which 94 rhinos were slaughtered in less than a week. I can't imagine a world without wild animals. That's one of the last bits of magic left on Earth for me, and we're annihilating it. When he's not on deployment, Arthur Berthaud is a beekeeper in France. One of the biggest problems that his troop faces is a lack of resources. You're right. The engine's just shot. This happens quite a bit, two or three times a day. The vehicles on the reserve are old, half a century out of date. Shoot as you want. And when it comes to weapons... Problem the extractor. OK, so take your magazine off. Incident tir! OK. Give me your weapon. The guns often jam. There's a reason for that, too. They're not exactly new, 53, with ammunition from Eastern Europe. They're in very bad shape. I've never seen ammo bent like this. It's unbelievable. That could lead to a situation in a shootout where none of the Rangers would be able to fire more than two or three shots. That's daily life in an anti-poaching team. It's a dangerous job, and it needs doing seven days a week, 24 hours a day, for miserable pay. You can maybe do a lot of work, more than expected, it's being a ranger, doing some extra work. What's the difference between the salary of a ranger and the price of the rhino home? <laughs> no, <laughs> the difference. <laughs> the difference is... Uh, <laughs> Maybe negative zero <laughs> from the rhino horn to the to the ranger salary. Rhinoceros horns are sold for astronomical sums on the black market. Chinese medicine claims the horn has therapeutic effects, though these have never been clinically proven. To discourage poachers, the reserve has implemented a radical method. After a veterinarian has sedated the rhino, the horn is cut off. It's a risky but painless operation. Like fingernails, the horns are made up of keratin. Hi, Sergio. How are you? Fine? No problem with yeah. you. Yes, nice to see the you. The owner of the reserve, Jaco Muller, has commissioned Sergio's NGO. Their service is free of charge. So you you happy with their progress? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 
Yako doesn't receive any support from the government for protecting his animals. But the value of their horns alone could cover the costs of protecting the species. We meet him at a secret place in the city. This is where he keeps his treasures. In the black market, this one will be worth roughly 450,000 US dollars. For us, it's, it's now actually dangerous to have it. People will come kill me. They will come to my house to kill me for these things. Over time, he's collected dozens of horns. He hopes that their sale will someday be legalised. The moment there's a larger supply to the market, the price will drop. If I can get um, 6,000 US dollar per kilogram, it can help me to save the species from extinction. And there's an additional perk. Legalisation would make him a millionaire. The young nation of Namibia, with its wealth of resources, its rich species diversity and wide open spaces, could provide for its population generously. But Namibia faces great challenges, a deeply skewed distribution of wealth, the global competition for resources, and of course, the long shadow cast by a bloody colonial past.